Hey, good afternoon. Lecture number five. And what we're going to discuss today is something that is a mathematically a challenge. Let me be uh, honest with you. So today is going to be something that is going to be a painful. This is almost like a scary lecture in the sense that level of difficulty is something that you haven't experienced ever before in your life. That's what I'm expecting. And uh, so what exactly we, we, what we're going to do today is that we're going to continue with the subject matter of ritual displacement and ritual work. We still need to look at that in a more thorough way and make sure that we have a clear physical interpretation um, what those two uh, fairly complicated concepts and a fairly um, theoretical concept, uh, what is it they can offer for us and what is it we can learn from them and why it would make sense to use these concepts. And as mentioned last week, uh, those concepts are needed to introduce something that is called generalized externally applied forces. And uh, that's where we're going to get started. And then what follows is, like I warned you already, something that is mathematically very involving. And uh, it's, uh, it's a scary thing. Uh, there's no other way to put that. So it's going to be something that um, not all the students uh, survived. And uh, we'll see how you will do it this year. But, uh, you know, at least you've been warned that this is going to be something that is uh, not pleasant anymore. Okay, <laughs> so uh, so there's a comment that there's a good motivation, but you know I some, I need to be honest, and that's why I make this uh, this graph, and this graph is showing that you know or it's a representation such that this x-axis here is a, is a time, and these are the lecture numbers one two and so on and so forth, and then this is a LD level of difficulty, also level of how scary is the thing. And we started here, so everything went smoothly. And I, as promised, we uh, we increased the level of difficulty progressively. So we started here, and we were going up slowly, like here. And this is, by the way, now this is three, four, five. This is this five. You know, and now it's what's going to happen today is that we're going to high up like this. And then we're going to come down. We will come down, so there is a high peak. And then we will go down. There is a little bit of rocky road like that, but then eventually, you know, end of the entire course will be something that we even go below zero, whatever that might mean. But anyway, so uh, we are at the moment, we're standing here. So we already experienced something that is uh, not pleasant, but what we're going to look at is a, is a huge mountain. It's a huge mountain and... Uh, what we need to do is that we need to climb up all the way to summit up that mountain together. And that's what, what I'm going to do with you today. While we hear that the views are beautiful, and then we can have a moment of celebration, and then we're coming down here. And next week, there's another peak here, and there's another peak is another big exp experience in your life. And that's when you're learning to solve the equation of motion or creating the equation of motion for any mechanical system you want. And then solving that by using a numerical time integration scheme. So that's what's gonna, that's what's gonna be uh, our schedule today and a uh, couple of weeks from now. Now, something that I would like you to be aware of, uh, there is a, uh, an interesting meeting event that I'm uh, recommending you to participate. This will be an um, online meeting event. And this online meeting event <clears throat> is going to be something that is organized by Mevia Software. And Mevia Software is a, is a company that is uh, physically very near to my university office. So they are located next to me in the University Business Park. And it's a university spin-off that is specialized to, guess what? Well, multi-body system dynamics. And what particularly they do in their business is that they are creating all different kind of real-time simulators for different product processes. So not necessary for user training, uh, not just for product development, but other product processes as well. And to learn a little bit more about those product processes, learn a little bit more about something that is very much in fashion at the moment, 
uh, that's called Digital Twin. I recommend you to participate in that meeting even. It's a free of charge. And uh, to do that, uh, please log into a website that is put it in a writing with the tiny, tiny font, but you can see it here. So it's a mevea.com. So that will be your way to get into that uh, meeting event. Here are the speakers. And the speakers are mainly coming from industries, a little bit of small font again, but uh, you can get, the, as promised, you can get a little bit of different point of view for how is it the simulation can be used in different processes. And that's exactly what I would like you to learn from this course. So, of course, I would like you to be aware of the details, like how is it you can solve the dynamics. But then later, in uh, period number two, I would like to put more emphasis on why it makes sense to know it and where are the applications or what are the applications that you can use or what you, where you can apply this knowledge of uh, multi-body system dynamics and simulation in general. And then we're going to look at the different product processes and uh, we will get started from the product development, but we're going to go all the way to, to recycling. And uh, that's pretty much, I mean, pretty much all the product processes are something that are uh, where you can apply multi-body system dynamics. So that's a news flash. And with that, let's summarize what is that we discussed last week. So last week we wrap up the kinematic analysis. And we concluded that the kinematic analysis consists of three steps. So first one is a position level analysis. And position level analysis is something that uh, is based on iteratory process. So it's not something that you can figure out by, in, by conducting a substitution. That's not enough. You need to compute something that is called Newton difference, and the Newton difference tells you how is that you should update your generalized coordinates to get the good estimation at any given time. And again, you know, look what we're doing here. So we're solving the Newton difference here, and the Newton difference is then used to update to generalize coordinates. Remember, it went like this. The new guess for the generalized coordinates you can get by having the previous guess plus delta Q. Now, take a look at this. So we are figuring out the generalized coordinates. Why? Because those are the ones that are really telling us how is your configuration at any given time. So if you know the generalized coordinates, then you know the position and orientation of every body reference coordinate systems. And if you know that, then you know where the, all the particles in the system are located at with respect to global coordinate system. And that's what the multi-body system dynamics is about. So that's a very fundamental. Okay, next step is a velocity level, which is simple. So that's a substitution. So you're basically substituting the information for Jacobian matrix and uh, equation that is a uh, constraints differentiated once with respect to time. So this is that component. Then the final step is uh, acceleration level analysis. And acceler acceleration level analysis is something that is um, a little bit um, challenging. And it's a little bit of challenging because it consists of this monster components where you get started with the Jacobian matrix, then that is then multiplied with the velocity of generalized coordinates. And that whole thing is then eventually differentiated with respect to generalized coordinates. And not even that, then one more time that's multiplied with respect to velocity of generalized coordinates. And then there are other components too. So this is something that is doable, but not as easy as a velocity level. Okay, so that's a kinematic analysis. And the kinematic analysis is something that for sure will be asked in the written exam, midterm exam, is something that is this Jacobian matrix. And Jacobian matrix is a, is a matrix that you can obtain by differentiating your constraints, your all constraint with respect to your all generalized coordinates. And based on the dimension of Jacobian matrix, you can tell what is a number of degrees of freedom of your system. Now, this is what I definitely recommend you to do. 
you know, in written exam, there are different kind of planner mechanisms. Like this could be an example. And, uh, you know, this is then a sliding joint, primitive joint. And then we're asking, okay, what is a J copy a matrix for this system? And to make sure that you can enter your answer correctly, please make sure that you have some kind of template ready in a symbolic math tool, math software tool, because, you know, as, you, as uh, you see the question like that, and then you start to solving that using a pen and paper, there's a high risk that you can make a mistake. You know, symbol, mistake about sign or incorrect differentiation or this and that. So to avoid that kind of um, mistake that easily can take a place, please make sure that you have a template ready, ready to go. Okay, um, you know, this is the one more thing of which is a position level analysis and uh, we discussed this already last week, so there's no need to uh, further discuss about that. Then also we open a little bit of this thing about what exactly we can do with the forces. And here's a challenge again. I, I, I must have to admit that the last Wednesday I was tired and everything. Today I'm not. So today I have my full energy. So, uh, so let me try to repeat this whole story about the virtual work and virtual displacement in a way that actually makes sense. And I realized I didn't really look at my, my streaming or my recording because I cannot do that by myself. But anyways, I, I was sensing that maybe there were too much explanation and too little like real actions. And let me try to redo that shortly again today. Here's the deal. What we wanted to do is that we wanted to express all the forces in terms of generalized coordinates. Typically, forces are expressed in terms of global coordinates. Example is this force vector, which is a force vector that is expressed in terms of global coordinates. How is that I know that? I know it because I can see that, uh, first of all, there is this sub index is X and Y, but more important than that, I can count the number of components here. And the number of components match the number of generalized coordinates. And generalized, excuse me, match the number of global coordinates. Number of global coordinates is X and Y. So that's two. So there are X and Y global coordinates. So this is expressed in terms of this coordinate system. And that's not okay to me. Why? Because what I'm really after all the time in my computing is a generalized coordinates. Why? Because generalized coordinates tells me the configuration of the system. So that's a secret that I'm after here. That's what I would like to figure out. So what are these generalized coordinates if I had the one beam like body? Well, actually it's not depending on the shape of the body. Everybody has the three generalized coordinates. This is what we learn. So we learn that the body or everybody needs three generalized coordinates. So these generalized coordinates are translation of the body reference coordinate system in global X and Y direction and orientation of the body reference coordinate system. That's what I would like to solve. It also means that the forces need to be expressed in terms of this set of coordinates. And now what we wanted to do is that we want to convert systematically this force of two components to be the forces of three components. And that's where this concept of virtual work and virtual displacement becomes to be handy because that actually can introduce the mapping between generalized coordinates and global coordinates. That's exactly what I wanted to do here. So that's a critical thing. All right. What is this uh, weird thing called virtual work? Well, virtual work is different than the real work in the sense that in the virtual work, we are assuming that the time is not running. So time is frozed. 
How is it you can find a work like that in a real life? Well, you don't. You don't. This is the first important thing. So consider that as a mathematical tool for introducing the mapping. Nothing else than a mapping. That's what you wanted to do. Mapping between the different coordinate systems. This time, global coordinates to tenorized coordinates. That's the mapping that uh, I wanted to do here. Okay, real work is something that you can figure out if you look at the displacement in the direction of force. How is it you can, using the multi-body language, how is it we can introduce that uh, displacement? By the way, I got the like, weird feeling because uh, I have no communication with you guys. I can only see that there's a one chat. So I hope that everything is okay and you guys are seeing me all right. Anyways, I know that this is um, something that you want to put all your effort to listen to me, which is a good, good idea, and not to use a chat. So I'm just hoping that everything is okay. I can see that every now and then the, the number of views are dropping dramatically down. I don't know what is the reason for that. So hopefully my connection is stable enough. Back to the work. So work is a displacement in the direction of force in terms of, or in a language of, okay, thank you guys. So I know that's a confirmation that you're still alive and everything seems to be okay. Now, displacement in the multi-body um, language. And I will get back to that, like how is that you can do your work virtually that I can tell you a bit later. That's maybe in the end of the entire lecture series. But anyways, so displacement can be expressed as shown here. So you take the initial, dis initial position and the final position. And when you express that, you know, you can do that by using this equation that we are very much familiar with. This one, okay? Now this change from beginning to end, we can call that as a delta as it is shown here. And now this is how you can express the work. So it's a delta R multiplied by force. Delta R, using your mathematical skills, can be expressed as it is shown here. Then this is coming from the chain rule of differentiation. So it's a parcel R, parcel T multiplied by delta T, plus parcel R, parcel Q multiplied by delta Q. Okay, so that's the real work. In virtual work, like mentioned earlier, time is not considered at all. Meaning that this component here, the first component, will disappear in the virtual work. So what will be left after that will be delta R, delta Q. R is a global coordinate, Q is a tenorized coordinate. So that's already the, what we are after here. So we are able to introduce that mapping that we desperately need with help of virtual work or with help of virtual displacement. So let's take a look how it goes. So virtual work is like real work, except this time the displacement is here, this uh, delta R, which is something that is considered to be very small. Don't think about it like that, because you, as soon as you start to think about like how small and what direction, you will be confused. Don't think about that, but think about it like delta. Mathematically, can be expressed in such a way as parcel R parcel Q multiplied by delta Q. That makes some sense, even though that this is mathematics, but it makes sense because it relates generalized coordinates and global coordinates. How? How it relates those things? With help of this guy here, this guy that is again parcel R, parcel Q. R is a vector of two components, Q is a vector of three components, so this obviously will be a vector having two rows, three columns. And that's mapping that conver converts our force from global coordinates to be expressed in terms of generalized coordinates. Okay, 
momentarily I will take a look at the, the what is that you guys are saying in a chat window. I could take a look at that right now. Okay, how you compute the okay the word okay that's a that's a great comment by the way. Uh, how is it you can uh, deal with the work because uh, uh, it's a matrix notation? Oh, that's that's not what you're asking here, but I'm uh, cutting the corners and making this an extreme statement. Okay, first of all, work is a scalar quantity. So it's a single number, it's a scalar quantity. It's not a vector, it's not a matrix, it's a work. It's a scalar quantity. How is that I know that? Well, you know that because you know it's a vector multiplied by vector. You do the math and what you end up to have is a single number. So it's a scalar quantity. So it's not gonna be a matrix. But we can play with this work. And we can play this in a way that we can make parts that are related to work to be expressed in terms of matrix and a vector. Final work, virtual or real, will be scalar quantity. Anyways, we gonna learn that when we gonna take a look at the next examples. But that's my message, real important message. What I wanted to do. Okay, and now last week we opened this thing about that there is this beam-like body, force is applying in a beam-like body in the position of O, called O that particular position can be expressed like this, which is, you know, big surprise. And what we're doing here is that this, there is a translation and orientation of body reference coordinate system and then vector U bar, all right? That's how you can find any particle, any location you want. That, that's what we are doing to find this particular location here, location where the force is applied, force that is expressed in terms of global coordinates. And now what we're doing next is that we're counting virtual work done by that externally applied force. How that happens? Well, it happens in such the way that this displacement R is multiplied by vector force vector F in such the way that I'm introducing this delta operation to my vector R, virtual displacement, virtual displacement. Uh, virtual displacement multiplied by four is that's going to be your virtual work, all right? But the real big deal is this. Now, using this mathematics, we'll look at the previous slide. You can relate delta R and delta Q. And relation is this one here, which is a matrix. This is a matrix here. Is a parcel R, parcel Q, and this is something that we will practice to use it in, a, well, in a several slides, what comes uh, later today. And that's, again, that mapping that we definitely need. This mapping matrix in mathematically can be expressed like this. And now you see that this mapping matrix consists of two rows. You see that? And three columns. First column, second column, and third column is that is a little bit involving is this one. So that's it. That's it. And now if I'm gonna, well, this is later called in a little bit of different way. So, so I'm expressing this mapping matrix is that's the way that it consists of sub matrix, which is identity matrix, this guy here. And then this guy, which is a rotation matrix differentiated one respect with respect to angle theta and then multiply by vector U by. This is coming from the parcel operation. So if you don't wanna use this shortcut, then don't use it. You can do the parcel operation and it's not gonna be a big problem to do so. But the big, a beautiful thing here, and it is okay to cry if you get emotional because you see the big picture here. So now the big picture is this. We started here in a concept of virtual work. And this virtual displacement, this one here, this is, I'm now going the reverse direction here. This virtual displacement here can be expressed such the way that it is relating global and generalized coordinates. And the way relating that is based on that mapping matrix that can be expressed like this. And here it goes. Now, when a force vector 
is multiplied by that, map, that mapping matrix, like it is shown here. What I will get as a result is force expression in terms of generalized coordinates. That's it. So this is it. So this is the final solution. This is how it goes. And again, no worries. We're going to practice this number of times today and then later too. So that's going to be a vector of generalized external applied forces. Generalized external applied forces comes from the fact that this force here is expressed in terms of generalized coordinates and is externally applied. Basically, in dynamics, we have two different kind of forces when cutting the corners, which I really wanted to do here. So we have, you know, we following this equation, we have external applied forces. That's the one. And if I'm looking like, you know, an example, it could be a box. And there's a force in both to that box. That is my external applied force. You can introduce the external applied force in real life by actuators. Those are hydraulics, pneumatics, whatever you want. But it's a force that is introducing the motion. And then there's another type of force, which is in the left-hand side of the equation. That's called inertia forces. And now D'Alembert figured out that this equation, this equation can be written like this. And he became to be world famous. So he realized that, oh my God, you know, I can take my force, my external applied force, and put it in the left hand side of the equation and put that equal to zero. Well, there was a more than that. And more than that was the fact that inertia forces can be treated exactly the same way that you can treat external applied forces. So now what we're doing here is that we're dealing with this external applied forces, but next second set of the forces, which is inertia forces, that too will be expressed in terms of generalized coordinates. So that too. This, by the way, here, when you look at, you know, how many components in this force component, that's two. How can I know that? Because, you know, the vector R is always the one that is expressing things in terms of global coordinates. So that too needs to be converted, but uh, that's not going to be right now because we still need to work with this other force component, this one here. And momentarily, I'm going to ask you an in-class quiz that is asking, okay, what is that this matrix? Where is my pointer here? Here. What is that this matrix here, parcel R, parcel Q, what that is doing for you? Think about it, what is that is doing for you? For sure, it's not going to introduce or it's not going to describe a rotation of a particle. That's clear. And for sure, it's not going to be having any relation whatsoever with the physical dimension of the body. But what it's doing for you is a mapping two coordinate systems together, global and generalized. That's what it's doing for you. And that, by the way, the in-class quiz is already on. So if you want to give a shot, you can do it already this time. So, and I'm here. Okay, this is how the force eventually look like. So this is when I'm converting that uh, force vector to be expressed in terms of generalized coordinates. And this definitely needs a practice. Otherwise, this is not going to be clear for you. So, so what we're going to do is that we're going to have one in-class quiz, and then we're going to practice. First comes in-class quiz. So if you were listening what I just said to you, this will be simple to you. But we're going to figure that out momentarily. So in-class quiz is on, and game is on. Uh, that's... Uh, game is uh, what's going to be the success rate today. So is it going to be the one we are after all the time in this course? Uh, that's a hundred percent. I doubt there could be a thin chance that there's a hundred percent, but I don't think so. But how much is going to be? Game is on. So you can put your cases in uh, chat. So we're getting started with a fairly high number. So it's a 97. So that's... Um, 
that's a good number. Oh my God, we are keep on the high numbers all the time. And there is my man, so there's 100% and more. 100%, so uh, what are we gonna do if it's really gonna be 100%? So there have to be some kind of a celebration dance, I think. Celebration song, maybe, I don't know. Okay, so I see that I have here 54, views no excuse me 56 that's what i'm looking at my um youtube studio and uh, i see that i have what 60 answers in my in-class quiz that makes no sense the numbers don't match up oh yeah i remember there was a last week there was a discussion about that too so so these uh, views may be incorrectly computed Okay, so anyways, I got 62 answers, which, by the way, is lower than uh, the number we started. I mean, in terms of number of students. We started from 70-something, and now we came down to 62, which uh, makes me a bit worried. But uh, we'll see. Oh, and that there's a like, celebration uh, going to outdoor market. Yeah, that, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, great. I don't get any more answers, so let me put the Socrative uh, visible for you guys. So it's um, here. What? Oh, yeah. Sorry, it's a kind of small. Let me try to make this a bit bigger. So here it is. No, 100%, I don't think so by myself. I'm thinking like 72. 72 is my answer. And the real number is this. Oh, I got scared. I got scared. Like, final is going to happen to me. I was like, oh, my God. I almost, like, I felt in my heart, like, it's 100%. Because the first one I realized is zero, zero, and then everything is green. So it was close case. Close case. So great news. First of all, the, the success rate is a record high. I think this is the highest so far. So it's a 97. 97 is, like, this close to 100, but not 100. And then uh, that's a good news. And then another good news is no one is voting for defines a rotation of a particle. That's that's a great news. Yeah, not the rotation of a particle uh, because um, you know why. But it's not going to tell in any relation about the applied forces and constraints. We haven't really discussed anything about that relation. All right. But anyways, let's take a look at an example. I have two examples here. Now here's the, now you need to pay attention because there is a next in class quiz that is somewhat similar than uh, than uh, the one we just looked at. And let me hide this that you can see um, see my slide again. All right. So ha here I have a beam like body, pretty similar than what we were looking at in this uh, like theoretical case. And now this time I have my body reference coordinate system located in uh, one end of the beam like body. And then there's a gravity force applying in the center of the mass of this body. And the gravity force is only having the y component. And this, of course, is expressed in terms of global coordinates, right? So the gravity force has no components in global x direction. And in the y direction, the component is uh, minus m multiplied by a gravity constant. Okay, and it's applying in there here in the middle. So what is going to be the generalized external applied forces? First of all, generalized, and now this is important because this next in class quiz is heavily related to what I'm about to say to you. We have one body. This one body has a three generalized coordinates. It means that the generalized external applied forces must have three components three components. So if there's a two components, that already is automatically incorrect. If it's going to be seven components, that's going to be, again, automatically incorrect. So three components. So now we are, what we wanted to do here, what is that we're hunting here, is that we wanted to express that force in terms of generalized coordinates. And now what I'm doing here is that I'm cutting the corners, I'm 
using the shortcut that was introduced used previously. Next example, I'm not using that shortcut. So the shortcut is that I'm having this mapping matrix that was introduced a couple slides back, which again is a sub matrix, this one here, which is identity matrix, and then this one here, which is a rotation matrix multiply, excuse me, differentiated with respect to angle theta, and that is multiplied by vector u bar. And that's mapping matrix. Now, don't get confused about transpose operation. I'm using here transpose operation, and that's why it looked different than in my previous slide. Concept with no difference. That is then multiplied by force. So now this becomes the B symbol. So here's my mapping matrix. And again, it's a transpose operation, so that's why it's looking a little different than in the previous case. So this time we have three rows, two columns. But again, look at this, this transpose, so that's why. So again, don't get confused about that. And then my force here. Uh, my vector U bar was used to get this mapping matrix. And once I do this multiplication, I get first of all three components. That's very important. Three components. Three components. And the first two components are very simple. So it's a force simply substituted as it is to these components. And the third one is a moment that the body reference coordinate system is experiencing due to these force components or two force components. This time it is traveling like here, so it's a function of the body orientation. So it's basically a level arm that is uh, from when the force is applying down, downwards like that. That's the level arm from the from the line where the force is applying to origin of the body reference coordinate system. That's what the third component is telling you. And the third component can be equal to zero when I'm uh, tilting myself like this in a particular configuration when the body is having the disorientation, or you know, now this is the how the body reference coordinate system is, or is having the dis configuration. So then there's no level arm. And then because there is no level arm, this moment that the body reference coordinate system is experiencing is equal to zero. Okay, here comes next. Hold on, I need to put my socket tape to my next page. Here's next. Okay, don't answer yet, don't answer yet. Here's same setup, but not the same setup because this is a little different than it was. And again, don't answer, listen to me. Now, the ways that you can find the correct answer is that you need to first of all come, you need to see what's the number of force components in different options. And that should match the number of generalized coordinates. And now how you know how many generalized coordinates you should have here, you need to think about what, are that, what is that everybody needs? And that's not love, like you think that everybody needs love. We are here discussing about a little bit different subject matters than the love. So how many generalized coordinates everybody needs? That's the first thing you need to ask to yourself, or you need to explain to yourself. Second thing, you need to take a look. How is a level arm from the force to origin of the body reference coordinate system, if there is a level arm at all. And if there is no level arm, that means that the final component is equal to, yes, zero. And now you go. Now you can answer your, you can put your, uh, enter your answer to Socrative system. Oh, so I'm excited. This is gonna be, maybe there is a, this is, an, first of all, usually, this is a question that uh, I think like last year, the success rate was like 15, 1.5%, so not the great success. But is it gonna be uh, higher this year? I think it is higher, but how much higher? Is it going all the way up to the 100%? Game is on. Maybe what you guys can consider to do as well, that is that maybe you have it this already, I don't know, but you know, the WhatsApp group that you can share some thoughts with your, you know, fellow students. So if there's a clever 
guide you can ask like what do you think that is a correct answer and it's okay to communicate like that so if we if we ever gonna go i hope we're gonna go to face-to-face -face lectures i'm encouraging the students to discuss so discuss and share some thoughts to figure out what is the correct answer okay we're getting started by 100 percent, but then we're going down all the way to you know that is as low as 45 45 is realistic i would say is it going to be that low yeah hard to tell that's hard to tell but they are 100 percent too so uh by the way how is that you like uh, my setup today i think that this is the best setup so far because slides first of all are not jumping left and right so they standing still all the time so i figured out what was a problem last time and i was able to fix it and my screen screen is looking great as well the only one that is not looking pretty is me but that's okay that's okay okay so we have hold on here uh, uh, 59 answers and last time it was a 60 what was it two i think now we got 60 answers so uh, momentarily we are good to go but yeah this is a great setup I, I agree with you guys but you know you should take a look like how is my office my office look like a tv studio rather than an office but today i'm planning to clean this place and make it look nice okay 62 and here it goes and the correct answer is what okay i was honestly i was hoping by myself that the success rate is a bit higher than the one we received and let me go back here and let me see how are the votes okay let's get started from very much incorrect votes and those that are very much incorrect are the c and d why because they are having two components only and remember what everybody needs that's three generalized coordinates everybody needs three generalized coordinates and those generalized coordinates are again rx ry and angle theta that's what everybody needs okay so it's telling you that the correct answer should have three components so what is left then is a choice a and choice b how is that you can know which one is a correct one well you need to take a look where is that the force is applying force is applying here in the center of the mass this time body reference corner system two is located in the center of the mass so how is a level arm between the force and origin of the body reference coordinate system no level arm that's zero meaning that the only one that can be correct is this one okay with that let's take a look at this but a little bit different point of view then so uh now this time the setup is such that i have triangular shape body and in the, my triangular shape body i have body reference coordinate system that is located in a one corner of this triangular shape body and then i have two forces applying in the remaining corners of this uh, body tr triangular shape body and these forces are expressed again in terms of global coordinates how can I know that? Because look at the number of, of force components, that's two. And what I wanted to do here is that I want to convert these two forces. First of all, I would like to put them together. And then I would like to express these two forces in terms of generalized coordinates. And generalized coordinates, one more time, is Rx, Ry, and angle theta. And what I will do this time is that I will do this in a hard way or conventional way. So I'm going to travel to place where the force is applying by using this equation that I know very well. This equation. And then I'm going to differentiate that equation with respect to my generalized coordinates, which is a 
this vector here. Okay, so it means that first of all, I need to get this one here. And then once I have this definition, then I differentiate that with respect to my generalized coordinates. And that's going to be what? Mapping. Mapping between the global coordinates and generalized coordinates. And I know that it's like confusing, like what, 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 what? You know, how come, you know, these generalized coordinates, uh, are they making any sense? Well, yes, like they're conceptually very different than... Uh, this Cartesian coordinate that is a global coordinate, but don't let that confuse you. Don't let that confuse you. All right. So I'm uh, here. Okay. So well, let's get started. So let's first uh, define the point A. This is that corner of that triangular shape body, and that's where the first first force is applying. Okay, so we know how to make it happen. So is this, so Rx, two by two rotation matrix, and then vector U bar, and vector U bar can be found here. So it's a matter of a substitute. Okay, you do the math and you get a vector of two components, vector of two components, which is then differentiated with respect to what? Generalized coordinates. And remember the generalized coordinates is again, For the first, this one body is like this. Okay, let's differentiate this one here first. With respect to Rx. So here's an Rx. So it's going to give you one. Then you redo the partial operation. And that, then you differentiate this equation with respect to Rx. Excuse me, Ry. And there is no Ry in that equation. That's going to be zero. And then you differentiate this equation one more time, but now this time with respect to angle theta, it's going to be like this. Very mechanical, very mechanical. That's why you need that uh, symbolic math tool because you don't want to do this by yourself because there's a risk of making a mistake. All right, then uh, you take the second equation and you redo the whole procedure and that's what you're going to get. That's going to be your mapping matrix. This is your force. This is your mapping. And once you do this operation, you get the three force components. And these force components are this force, as it is in a two force component. And then the final the moment that is a function of the body orientation. And how much the moment is this body reference coordinate system experiencing? That's it. And then uh, again, same thing again. This time, the difference is that we're going to go to point P here. And when we're going to go to point P, you know, the vector U bar will be different. All the components will be no changes. All right. So you substitute the vector U bar here and you keep the rest as they are. And then you differentiate this with respect to Rx, Ry, and theta. And you redo that. I mean, this equation, and you differentiate that too with respect to your Rx, Ry, and theta. And that's going to be your mapping matrix. And now, multiplying the mapping matrix or force with the mapping matrix, you're going to get, again, vector of three components. This is the force, as it is. And this is how much the body reference coordinate system is experiencing the moment. And that's it. Final step. You're combining them together. You're combining them together by adding the fours associated to this corner, fours associated to that corner, and this is it. This is it. You know, because the fours is all the time pointing this direction, regardless of, I mean, like this direction, regardless how is a body orientation. You know, the certain configurations like shown here, so uh, 45 degrees and 115 degrees these forces are eliminating each other and then there is no moment whatsoever. That's it. That's about that. So and, uh, I don't know, is it what is uh, the last week I said that I was tired by myself. Maybe this week is, uh, is it so that you guys are tired because I see no comments, very little interaction this time. But it could be also that uh, this time the subject matter is 
more challenging than usually. Uh, maybe that's the case. What about the moments then? How is that you can deal with the moments? Well, that's easy because the moments you can, uh, you can uh, that's much more easier to deal with. So if you have a moment applying in a body, oh, I got uh, scared because, you know, I got the, you know, some kind of disconnection signal to my head. That... Okay. So, um, moment, applying in a body, you could just add it to this third component. It's simple like that. So, no thinking needed. Uh, that's about it. Okay, so you guys are saying, okay, this time you want, you really need all the energy to digest uh, what I'm about, or what I'm explaining you. And I do understand that. I do understand that. With that, I know that we're a little late in our predefined schedule, but um, now we're ready to move on to next force component. We're still going to practice this generalized externally applied forces number of times, but let's put that aside a little while. Uh, let's look at the, how is this second force component. Again, dynamic equ equation of motion is telling you that uh, two forces that you can have in your system, which are inertia forces and externally applied forces are in balance. So they have an equal amount. This is a dynamic equilibrium. And what we did for this guy was that we expressed that by using generalized coordinates. So we converted that to be this one. Now what we need to do next is that we need to do the same trick or same procedure for these inertia forces. Inertia forces will be more painful. Why? Because remember how was a definition of acceleration? That was a pretty involving. And remember, we discussed that, um, I think it was like three weeks back. At that time, I warned you that, okay, now we have the acceleration that consists of three components. And yes, it consists of three components. And the acceleration is something that is um, linear, you know, something that there are components directly related to translation on, and rotational acceleration, and then the one that is quadratically related to angular velocity. So we have angular velocity here that is messing things up, seriously. And it's going to introduce all kinds of complications, which I'm sure we can handle if we can uh, relax and go easy and take a look how is that we can make this happen. So you guys ready? I'm ready. So uh, let's, um, I don't know, maybe I'm not planning to have any break, so if it is okay to you, so let's just uh, breathe deeply a couple of times, like one more time, and then we're going to go. And now comes the most scary part from this class a most mathematically involving part, and it's going to be, I'm, I trust that uh, this is the, there's no other subject matter, this level of difficulty in your master level studies. So if you can handle this, you can handle everything. Okay, so inertia forces. Now, let's express the inertia forces, but in a very sophisticated way. Okay, how is that we can express that in a sophisticated way? Well, previously I said that the inertia forces is mass multiplied by acceleration. Yeah, sure, but you know what is this mass? You know what is this mass component? You know because this guy here, this acceleration is expressing acceleration of a particle, and remember the particle it was this tiny, tiny thing that. Uh, don't even have a clear dimension. So how is, if there is no dimension, how is that you're gonna compute the mass of the particle? Well, it's a bit difficult. So maybe it would be better to express the mass slightly different way. So what if we're gonna simply take a density of every particle into account and we can integrate that density over the volume of the body? That's gonna be our mass, right? Yeah. So let's use that. That's 
like more advanced or let's say mathematically a bit more advanced way, way to say mass. And now this takes every single particle into account. Why? Because I have here a volume integral here that is scanning every single particle within my body. So it's scanning everything. So it's summing up each of these millions and millions and millions of particles. How and how it is accounting that? It is accounting that by taking the density into account. So that's that's the way to go. That is then multiplied by acceleration of each one of these particles. All right. So that's what we have so far. Now, if this is a force, and if we learn from Dell and Barrett that this force can be treat, treated exactly the same way than externally applied forces. So let's treat that exactly the same way than externally applied forces. And let's introduce virtual displacement for inertia forces. How it goes? Well, this force is then multiplied by a transpose of uh, virtual displacement, which have, better to say, no clear physical meaning. But it's just a tool that is doing the mapping for us. And we need this mapping because this force here consists of two components. No good. I'm not happy with that because I would like to have this force expressed by in terms of generalized coordinates. So that's uh, that's uh, that's the thing that I wanted to do. I need to take a look. What is that you guys say? <laughs> okay, so you guys like that the explanation? Great. Um, yeah. So we're gonna do this virtual displacement. That's what we're gonna do. All right. Now, when you introducing this whole or, or taking this. Um, this one here, this expression of inertia forces, and put it is here. This is how the virtual work done by inertia forces can be expressed. So that's it. That's it. What we're going to do next is that we're going to use this guy here to introduce the mapping between the global and generalized coordinates. And then we're going to substitute the acceleration here, and that's, that's it. Done deal. Done deal. All right. This is a mapping. We get started from this mapping. And now this again is relating global and generalized coordinates. Great. No further thinking needed. Let's just do the substitution. Let's substitute that as it is here. So this is the mapping. And now we have here delta Q, which is important because this is now generalized coordinates. And now this gives us a new component, which is a put it in a writing down here. So this is called generalized inertia forces, which is still in a form that is no good for us because, you know, it's too much uh, unclear notations here. So I want to make this more clear. And that requires that this component needs to be expressed in a more clear way. Rest is pretty much okay. Okay. So you're still with me. Hope that you're still with me. So still try to relax. This is almost done. You know, remember this this huge mountain. So remember this 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 picture. There is this summit of the mountain. So we are almost there. So we can almost see the summit. So a couple more minutes and we're done. Now next, I'm gonna take my acceleration. The one we discussed three weeks back, we discussed that the acceleration consists of three components that are translational acceleration, component associated to quadratically to angular velocity, and the components that is associated to, oh my God, that did this, by the way, is a mistake. This there should not be power to the component that is directly associated to angular accelerations. So this too is a mistake here. So when you reorganize in these components, that's the way that you have here. Maybe I should take this one away to make this clear. Okay, you reorganize in this uh, expression of acceleration such that these are the 
acceleration of generalized coordinates, and then there is this quadratic term that is left. You can do it like shown here. All right. Then I'm going to do this introduction, introducing these substitutions. I'm going to substitute my acceleration here and my mapping, which we concluded that can be expressed using this shortcut. I'm going to put it that there. And uh, then we're going to go. Then we're going to simply do the mathematics and then we're done. Now we almost there. So, you know, we can all see the summit. So we're almost in the top of the mountain. So with just the final effort, then we can do this together. So here it goes. So I'm doing this, this mapping here first. Then this is my acceleration, this whole thing. And I'm simply doing the mathematics. It's just the mathematics. So don't get confused about mathematics because it's more mechanical than you may think that it is. Okay, so I'm going to compute the whole thing here. And what's going to be here as a final conclusion is that there's going to be a, something that is uh, directly or linearly related to acceleration and something that is quadratically related to velocities. Something that is directly and linearly related to acceleration is going to be called mass matrix. The one that is left, the one that is quadratically related to uh, angular velocity is going to be our quadratic velocity vector. We need them both. There is some good news. Now, the good news is that in many of the cases, this guy can be neglected, particularly if you're going to in planar case, if you're going to put your body reference coordinate system to be in your center of the mass, then you can simply neglect this guy. Makes things easier. So the only thing that is left is this mass matrix, which you need to compute. That's what we're going to com compute next. Yep. Yeah, I know that, you know, uh, this Hitchcock is, uh, is a easy to deal with when comparing this. This is, you know, usual horror movies, nothing, absolutely nothing comparing what we just experienced. But I have some good news. You you feel the same thing that I feel? Yes. So we are here in a summit. So we made it. So we're top of the mountain. You know, in a mountain climbing, what is usually more dangerous than going up is going down. And now we're going down, and when going down, there's still some risk in risk component involved. And those risk components are this mass matrix and quadratic velocity vector. Those are the things we're going to learn next. And then we're done, by the way. Then we have all the components, not all the components, but pretty much all the, well, we actually have all the components we need to create the equation of motion. So. Let's take a look. When I do this, um, mm, volume integrals. Yes, sure. Volume integrals will be no problem. We're going to take a look at that a bit later. So, so um, no worries in that regard. Again, I don't think you should be worried about the volume integrals because. Uh, just use a symbolic math tool. And the volume integral can be, if, if of course, something that will be broke down to symbol integrals as can I say, will show you a bit later today. So no worries in that regard. Anyways, so when you do the mathematics, and let me say now there's a lot of comments. Oh yeah, there's a crying. Yeah, which is okay. You know, it's a, it's it's a completely okay to have high motions because this is a is a big deal. But next week, even going to be bigger than that, because that, that's when we're going to learn to conduct uh, dynamic analysis. Bigger deal than kinematic analysis. And the kinematic analysis already, I think that I was, I was crying, at least after the lecture, I was crying. And I think I hope you too. So anyway, so now we're here. We're still not completed on. So we're now looking at the mass matrix. So from the previous slide, this one here, when you do this mathematics, this is how the mass matrix look like. All right. Mass matrix is something that um, consists of three different components. A mass matrix, first of all, 
four of one body is a three by three matrix. Why? Because we have three generalized coordinates. Why? Because every body needs three generalized coordinates. Okay? Now, uh, the component that is located in the upper left corner of the, the mass matrix is going to be two by two sub matrix, which is very simple. It's simple diagonal matrix where the diagonal component of the body is a mass, excuse me, diagonal component of that two by two sub matrix is a mass of the body. So those are the masses. And now comes very important thing. Mass of the body is not the function of where that you're going to put your body reference coordinate system. It's always going to be the same. So mass will not change as a function of mathematical representation. Mass is a mass. Simple like that. that that's what I'm going to ask next. So be aware. All right. Then uh, the one that is incorrectly notated here. So this is a scalar component. This is a correct notation. So the one that is located in the lower right corner of this uh, mass matrix is a scalar component. So it's a single value component. And that scalar component is something that is called as a mass moment of inertia. Mass moment of inertia is something that how much you experience that the mass of inertia is resisting your rotation. And that depends how you rotate in your system. So if you're going to rotate your pen here in the middle, so you feel almost like no resistance whatsoever. So it's very easy to do so. Whereas if you take a hold on the one end of the bend, you can feel that there is a more resistant. And that's a mass moment of inertia. So it depends how you do the rotation. Now, where is that uh, um, shortly stated? Where is that your body reference coordinate system is located at? All right. And that's how you can compute it. Then you can compute that by using pre-calculated tables, as I will show you next week. Then there's a one more component that relates translation and rotation. This is equal to zero if and only if body reference coordinate system is located in the center of the mass. OK. And uh, we're moving forward. OK, now there is an example. So there is an example of box-like body. And this is where you're going to learn about the volume integrals. So the box-like body, with this volume integrals, by the way, is a bit confusing because those, of course, are three-dimensional space. And we here dealing with the spatial case, two-dimensional. Excuse me, we're dealing here the planetary case, which is a two-dimensional space. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to ignore this third dimension, which is which is uh, this jet direction. So uh, now I know that you guys are worried, like, how the heck am I going to pass this course? And you will be surprised that you, there is no problem whatsoever if you're going to work with me. So, But if you're not going to be with me, there is no way that there is absolutely no way that you can survive here. That's why I said in the very beginning that make sure that you're not skipping lectures or reading assignments because you need to do that every single week. Otherwise, you will be simply off. All right. So here is my box-like body. The dimension now such that the length is L and the height is H here. And I'm going to compute my mass matrix for this body. Let's get started from first by this um, two by two sub matrix that is located in the upper left corner. So what I'm going to do here, and you don't need to do this in this hard way. So you could simply use uh, some common sense and pre-calculated tables. So if you know that the dimension are L, W, uh, w is mentioned, H is not even mentioned here. So, and the density, or the length and width. Okay, so this W is this uh, jet direction that is not shown here. So I'm simply taking my volume integral such the way that this jet direction is given to me. So it's W. And then I'm integrating from minus L, because L is this component here. So I'm getting started here, which is a minus. Hmm. L divided by 2, 
and I'm going to go all the way here, which is L divided by 2. So that's going to be my integration limits. And I'm going to integrate that component here. And then I'm going to do the same, but this direction. So I'm going to get started by minus L, excuse me, H divided by 2. And I'm going to go all the way to H divided by 2. OK, so uh, the first thing that I do is this uh, L direction. So it's going to give me L multiplied by W. And that's then multiplied by density. Then the one more thing. This y direction is going to be my density, h, l, w. This is equal than volume. Mass is equal than density multiplied by volume. OK, so that's where my mass comes. And that's then multiplied by this identity matrix, this guy here. And the result is mass of the body located in the diagonal of this 2 by 2 matrix. Simple. Next, I'm going to compute the mass. Uh, well, this, uh, mo this component that relates translation and rotation. You know, here I'm cutting the corners a little bit. You can uh, redo this by using the symbolic math tool if you want. But this is going to give you zero vectors. So it's zero that comes out from that. So that's it. So it's pretty simple. I could tell that immediately when I realize that the body reference coordinate system is located in the center of the mass. And I know that because, you know, if you integrate x, is that's the way that there's like, you know, let's put here like L minus L divided by 2 to L divided by 2. And then this is a dx. So it's automatically going to be 0. So because how can I put it in a better picture? Like like if there is a graphical representation, it's going to be like this. So you're counting, counting this, and you're counting that, and they eliminate each other. So that's where they go. So let's take that off. Final component, this mass moment of inertia. So I have here vector u bar multiplied by vector u bar. And that's how it's going to be. So it's a u bar x power 2, u bar y power 2. So now the integration is no longer as easy as it was. I, hear his, I have here this z direction, which is the w. When I conduct the, the first is a x direction, this is how, uh, what I'm going to get as a, my integration operation. And when I conduct the y direction, this is what I get as a result. This 2 here is a mass, and this is the final result. Now, this is a final conclusion. I have here diagonal representation. Diagonal representation because the body reference coordinate system is located in the center of the mass. Now, I'm going to have two interesting in-class quizzes. And uh, before that, let's take a look at the same example, the same box-like body, with the difference that the Body reference coordinate system is located in a one corner of the box like body. Where is that we can see the difference? So is the mass going to be different in this case? No way. Mass is a mass and is not a function where the body reference coordinate system is located at. So that's definitely the same. What about mass moment of inertia? Yes, that will be different because it means like are you going to take account the rotation with respect to this coordinate system that is in the middle or the coordinate system that is in the one end? And yes, mass moment of inertia is different in that case. It's definitely different. What about this third component? This is this off diagonal component. What that's going to be? That's going to be non-zero. That's going to be non-zero because now we need to relate translation and rotation. All right. And that later then will be accounted in a quadratic velocity vector too. But here's my second example. And I know that is uh, only, think about this. You know, it's only 15 minutes left, one five minutes, and then you're off the hook. So you can make it. You can make it. So uh, now uh, first component, two by two submatrix. And it's all the time same, so no difference. But this time the, the volume boundaries are different because this time when I'm integrating the x direction, it's not going to be minus L divided by 2 to L divided by 2. Why? Because the body coordinate system is located here. 
So now the integral starts here, which is equal to zero. And it goes all the way here, which is equal to L. All right. Then this y direction is going to be the same story here. So we get started here in a zero and we go all the way to H. Okay. So these are the, oh my God, look at that. So it, there is a mistake. So this is supposed to be, of course, H not W. I don't, I'm not going to change it here, but anyway, so this is supposed to be, of course, H. Oh, what a mess. You know, here I can see that, you know, uh, there is a typing mistake here. I need to fix. I need to fix this a bit later. But anyway, so what's going to be an our final outcome is a two by two matrix where the mass is located in the diagonal compound. Now, <clears throat> the one that relates translation and rotation. This is something that I don't have a clear physical interpretation of what this is. I do have that a bit later when we look at the quadratic velocity vector, but this time we just need to mechanically compute it. All right, so this is how it needs to be computed. So we have, first of all, rotation matrix that is differentiated with respect to angle theta. We can take that off from the integration because it's not uh, needed in integration. What is left is this guy here. And then we're simply conducting this uh, integration again by using this boundary 0 to L, 0 to H. And once we do that, we're going to get the vector of two components like this. Final is this mass moment of inertia, which again will be different because the integration boundaries will be different. And it's going to be like this one. Remember previously it was a mass divided by 12 multiplied by L power, power 2 multiplied plus H power 2. H, if there's a thin body, is insignificant. So this, of course, when you look at the numerical values, is having the smaller numerical values when comparing to this. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. Remember, take a pen and rotate it like this, and it feels nothing. Take the same pen and rotate it like that, and yeah, it's a kind of heavy. But that's okay because, you know, look at that. Big muscles, so no worries. Big muscles that are capable to do a lot of chin-ups. Remember, these other competition we have. Okay, back to the business. Okay, now I'm just summarizing everything. So I'm going to put together uh, this computing. So I'm going to take these two by two sub matrix. I'm going to substitute that here. And then this uh, matrix that relates translation and rotation with transpose here, without transpose here. And this is my scalar component that is mass moment of inertia. That's it. And now my next in class quiz is this. How much body mass will increase? Okay, here what I'm saying, body mass. How much the body mass increase, decrease from case A to case B? And now what is the difference between these two cases? In these two cases, in the first case, the body reference coordinate system is located in the center of the box-like body. And in the second case, it's going to be in a corner of uh, that box-like body. And I'm asking how much mass is changing because of this change. How much mass is... You, you got it. You, I don't need to repeat that. But you know what I'm after here. And uh, Socrative, I got 70 answers. So that's a surprisingly high number because again, oh, I got uh, more views here. But the next soccer day is on. All right. So I, now the options are how much mass is increased, decreased. So the first option is that it decreased by L divided by 12. No change. So the mass is not a function of body reference coordinate system. Then the then the C is increased by L divided by 12. And final one is increased by L divided by 3. 100%. Oh, my God. You guys are saying 100%. I don't think, I, I think you are simply wrong. I think you are wrong. But, it, okay, if it's going to be 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%
we still have a 10 minutes to go, 12 minutes to be more specific. Um, the rest will be celebration dancing, 12 minutes. Think about that. No, no, it's not going to be 100%. You guys are wrong. I don't, I don't believe you. I have 62 answers. So uh, last time it was 70, so 70. So maybe it's going to be a bit more. Number is not increasing anymore, so maybe you guys are done. No, it's, it's increasing. It's increasing. Okay. This is interesting question in my mind. This is one of the most interesting ones so far. How much the mass is changing depending how you put your body reference on the system? Okay. 64. And I got, when I look at my um, YouTube studio, studio, I can see that I have 58 views. Maybe I simply close the case. Okay, 65 and uh, we done. So, let's just take a look. Let's just take a look. I'm a bit scared that maybe their the success rate is much higher than I'm anticipating. I'm because I'm anticipating that the success rate is a uh, 75. Oh, look at that. It's it's good, but not 100 percent. Okay, how much the mass is changing? You know, we see that when we take this Socrative off. Oh, by the way, I did not make a record about uh, Wieners. I need to take it out. I need to take a look at the record, you know, the how are the Wieners a little bit later. But I think at the last time there were Wieners as well. This is already third in class quiz of the day. So anyways, I need to take a look at that later. Uh, I want to take this off. Right. So we're here. Mass is not changing as a function of the body reference corner system. So if you weight yourself, your body weight will be the same regardless where your body reference corner system is located at because the body reference corner system is a is an artificial thing. It's something that is helping us to describe the dynamics, but it's not defining your mass. So it's not defining that. How we know that? We know that because, you know, if we go back to This example here. Oh, hold on, let me go back here. I think this is a better thing. You know, we, we look at this box-like body in a two different scenarios. In one scenario, the, bo the body reference corner system was located here in this corner. In another scenario, it was located in the middle. And now if you look at this uh, submatrix that tells the mass of the body, this one here, the one that is shown here, is always the same. It's not making any difference whatsoever. So. I'm sorry about that question because it was partly made intentionally to make you confused. But don't get confused. Don't get confused about two things. You know, the physics is always the physics and trust your common sense. You have it. And another thing, don't get confused about mathematical details. It's not worth of it. It's simply not worth of it. Okay. And... Um, I'm going back to my PowerPoint presentation um, here. All right. So that was my in-class quiz. And my second in-class quiz is this. Okay. So uh, figure solves a rectangular bi planar body. And, you know, these are the, the dimensions that are provided here. And I'm asking which one of these uh, mass matrices are the ones that is representing this particular configuration. First thing that you need to take into account that you need to make sure that the dimensions match for the number of generalized coordinates. Okay. So how many generalized coordinates each body needs? You need to know that number. The next thing you need to take a look, where is that the body reference coordinate system is located at? Is it in the center of the mass or someplace else? 
if it is in the center of the mass, then that simplifies description of a mass matrix. So those that's th those are the two hints that I would like to provide to you. And the game is on again. Uh, this is my last in-class quiz of the day. Uh, let me see. Is it like uh, you guys are not guessing this or you did or or I guess that you are still thinking about what is the correct answer and then you're going to do your guesses. My guess this time is this, 75. Hmm. Oh, this keyboard is not working. This one. 75. Okay, and the game is on. <clears throat> Great. Now the only, I cannot really move on because you guys need to take a, you need to see my slide, otherwise you are unable to answer this question. And then uh, momentarily we're done with this. And then the one more thing is this quadratic velocity vector and then that's it. That's it. Then what follows is, I need to show you this briefly. This one here, equation of motion. Yes, sir. It's going to be equation of motion. So we're going to put together equation of motion and then we're going to solve the dynamic responses of any mechanical system you want, anything you want. Right, but we were, uh, we were here. So uh, I got 62 answers. I think that I within a minute or so I'm gonna close this thing. So very soon. So it was a rough day today. So we went all the way out, all the way up to the mountain, and now uh, we came down and we survived. And uh, I hope that it feels good. Okay. 63 answers. Uh, maybe some of you already uh, made a conclusion that this is not going to fly. I'm not going to survive this class, which is an incorrect cl conclusion because you will definitely. There is no problem whatsoever. You can make this happen. You can easily make this happen. Okay, so 65. So I'm going to close this case. Here is a secretive. And the solution is this. Okay, so honestly disappointed, a little bit disappointed, but we do have some good news too. So it's only uh, roughly 20% that is voting completely incorrect mass matrix, completely incorrect in the sense that if their dimensions are two by two, that's absolutely incorrect. Why? Because everybody needs three generalized coordinates, three, not two. Three. Okay, so let's go back here. So, body reference coordinate system is located in the center of the mass. And if it is located in the center of the mass, then off diagonal components will be equal to zero. Where are the off diagonal components equal to zero? Well, C and B. C is no good. Why? Because it's two by two matrix. Uh, we need three generalized coordinates. So the B is the only correct one. All right. I know that three minutes left. Quadratic velocity vector briefly, briefly. Quadratic velocity vector, I, uh, yeah. Well, everybody needs three generalized coordinates and love. What is it we need more? We need three generalized coordinates because that's really what we need then love would be an additional thing. All right, that's getting too philosophical. So um, now this uh, quadratic velocity vector, here's how you can compute it. So now I'm doing this, uh, again, this mathematical notation. So I'm taking that from my previous slide and I'm computing all the components. And this one here is something that you can, uh, I mean, that this I think it is explained in details in a lecture now that this is equal than the zero. What is left is this vector here. 
and this vector is something that consists of two components and it can be interpreted let me let me put like this so it can be interpreted like how much the body reference coordinate system is experiencing the rotation or how well it experiences the rotation all right so if you have a body reference coordinate system here in the center of the mass and you're rotating your structure so it's not experiencing that at all because the moment level arm again is zero so it's not experiencing that at all and that's when the quadratic velocity vector will be equal to zero but if it is in somewhere else like located in the end of the beam like body yes then it experienced that how much experience well it's this one here this tells how much it experienced that so it's kind of like um, centrifugal force if you wanted to simplify it that's what the quadratic velocity vector is and that's where we're going to stop today what follows is super pleasant story because we we went all the way up to the, that mountain that huge mountain big one we came down now we're just wrapping things up and uh, wrapping things up means that we are expressing the equation of motion only challenge in that regard is that we have this inertia forces and we have external applied forces and that's uh, something that tells how the body can move only thing that makes this a bit complicated is that we also have these constraints that are limiting the motion possibilities so we need to simultaneously account these force balance in a way that we are not violating against the constraint that's the last thing we need to do that's by the way is an optimization problem so it's a constraint optimization problem, which I will get back to you next week, Wednesday. And look at that already. It's like unbelievable. So that's going to be already lecture number six. And what follows after that is just a summary. And then we do. Then we're done. Okay. So guys, take it easy and uh, see me momentarily in a team session. And again, the way to find yourself to a team session is that you need to take a look at that. One of the messages that is available in a model, I think it was a first first email to the model. Click the link, click, click that link, and uh, see you me in uh, Teams in two minutes. Now, where is my?